Hi everyone, Mache here. I'm the CEO of APIS. I'm so happy to see that we have so many people attending our two webinars today. I think it's amazing that so many people found time to join this free 5G webinar with Bengt Nordstrom. Today we have participants from all over the world, from all the continents. The only exception is Antarctica. We don't have any participants from there, but the rest people from all over the place. Um, some practicalities uh, today uh, before starting the webinar. Um, we have a moderator, Martin is here. Yes, hello, my name is Martin and I will be the moderator for this session. What that means is I'm going to collect questions from you all out there in the world to present to Bengt at the end of this hour. So you can ask Bengt questions, and in order to do that, you choose the button at the lower part of your screen called Q and A. That's for questions and answers. There's also a chat button that you can use, but the other one is better. Actually, Justin has already said good morning from Canada. <laughs> good morning, Justin. Um, so uh, please use the Q and A button, and uh, there will probably be lots of questions because you, you are a lot of people listening. Uh, so we will have to sort of select uh, some towards the end. Um, I think that's all I'm <coughs> going to say right now. So back to you, Mache. Thank you, Martin. So now the moment we all have been waiting for, Bengt Nordström. Thank you, Mache. Um, very nice to be here with uh, APIS this afternoon. And of course, also very nice to have this big audience from around the world. So I'm Bengt Nordström, the CEO of a consulting firm called Northstream. I myself have been around in this industry for about 35 years, working for vendors and operators, and then for the last 20 years uh, consulting. Um, I will talk very briefly about uh, our company, not to promote ourselves too much, but just so you know where we fit into this map in the telecom industry. So we were founded 20 years ago. So we celebrated our 20th anniversary last week, actually. We are privately owned. Uh, we are about 30 people based in Stockholm here in Sweden and Helsinki in Finland. We primarily focus on the Nordic region, but we have clients from all over the world and we have done projects in more than 50 uh, markets or countries. Uh, strategy advising is one of our main businesses and we are actually we are very honored and pleased that we are sometimes seen as uh, thought leaders in this industry and you will find if you look up on the internet that we are quoted in many reputable magazines such as The Economist, Financial Times and other publications. Uh, our line of business, um, I have divided them into five categories here. First of all strategy consulting which we do for operators and vendors and investors in today's market, mainly about 5G. We've done more than 10 5G projects this year. The next two, sourcing and transformation, is where our volume business is. We help operators to buy system solutions for 5G and other equipment and uh, solution areas and we also work a lot with transformation. We're helping operators to become more agile and efficient than they are today, which is very important in a market where revenues are not really growing. So that's the volume of the business. Then we are have a focus on the Internet of Things, which we've been working with for the last 20 years and more intensively over the last five, six years when we have moved from M2M to, M to the IoT market. And finally, a nice side business, which is upstream, where we help uh, startup companies in Scandinavia to be successful in their strategy and execution of their business. Uh, we don't do a lot of money there, but we do that to build a network with the, all the exciting and flourishing companies in the Scandinavian marketplace. Finally, on about the company, uh, this is a sample of clients we have been working with, and I show it to illustrate that we are working globally, and we are working with everything from tier one vendors, operators, investors, media companies, down to startup, uh, the startup sector. So that's what we do. Now, uh, moving into the main topic of today, so I will spend the next sort of 40 minutes or so 
about 5G, talking about the drivers and requirements of that market, what it is technically, the timelines and some very important business considerations when we talk about 5G. So first of all, uh, beginning with the basics, uh, every 10th year we get a new uh, mobile standard starting with 1G in the 80s, starting with GSM in the early 90s, moved to 3G UMTS in the early 2000s, moved to LTE in 2010 about, and now we are ready for the next standard, 5G, uh, which will come in about 2020. And if we look here on the right hand side, we see the characteristics of 5G, how it is defined and what we can expect from that technology. So starting at one o'clock then on the right hand side, we should be able to handle 10 to 100 times more devices than we can handle today, which means that we can handle many tens of billions of devices, at least that's the expectation of the industry. We will have improvements in latency going down to low millisecond levels. We will talk about uh, peak rates of 10 gigabit per second and about more than 100 megabit per second for many simultaneous users. We will have improvements in battery life for low power applications uh, where, with ba where batteries can last for more 10 years. This is very important for the IoT sector. And finally, we should be able to handle 10,000 times more traffic than we could do in 2010. What is important to remember now that uh, the reason why we get technology every 10th year is because there are many different driver, drivers, but one reason is that the, uh, the vendor community uh, get the mature sales in the existing technology, so they need to move on to something new so they can sell new things to operators. So it's partly driven by that, but it's also driven by the fact that there are so many things happening in the market with increased traffic growth in voice in text and in data and you need to evolve the standard to better cope with how the market is evolving. So all that is resulting in 10 year cycle of technologies. And most of the time the technology arrives a little bit ahead of the need in the market. It's good to know. Now a very important factor when you talk about 5G and what we can expect to it is to look at what is actually the trend for the operators here. The, the the, the companies that are buying um, <coughs> the technology from the vendor community. So if we look at this diagram, we see three curves um, that are uh, on the top here slightly growing. That's the revenue trend in the US market from 2008 until 2017. The second one you see there, which is slightly declining, is the Western European revenue trend, which actually has been declining since, 20, uh, since 2008 until 2017. And then the grey one here uh, is a growing curve until 2012, uh, and then basically flat or slightly negative, and that's the revenue trend in the Chinese market. So aggregated we are in an industry that doesn't really grow in in revenues so it's flat or even slightly declining the bottom uh, curve here is actually the uh, traffic growth curve how much uh, data traffic we have in mobile networks and that is almost looking like an exponential curve so it means that we have 40 to 50 percent traffic growth still in this industry and of course those two combine doesn't go too well together because if you have no revenue growth it's very hard to finance further increase in networks and in capacity and that's of course the challenge for this industry. Another maybe small but interesting point here if, if you're really interested into the details here is that in Europe, in Western Europe, we actually have more revenues in mobile than the US market had when we were in 2008. But now when we are in 2017, uh, the US market is generating much more revenues for the operators. You know, there are many reasons for that, but I can, that's maybe a, a, a topic for a separate discussion. If we then look at how that translates into investments, so how much does operators invest in new technology, we have three curves here as, as well. We have a grey one here which you see is peaking in 2014. That's the capex trend for the Chinese market, so it really invested a lot from 2010 until 2015. And that was when China migrated from 
uh, legacy 3G on t to um, LTE, and they did that in a massive scale where they deployed more than a million base stations per year, I think between 2014, 15, 16, something. The red curve here is how it happened in the US. It's a similar phenomenon because they also migrated from 3G to 4G. But the, the shifts weren't too big here. So they had, we had a growing CapEx trend in the US market from 2008 until 2012. And then it has roughly been flat or even negative. And the bottom curve here is uh, what happened in Western Europe, which has basically been flat uh, for a 10 year period. So all, all together here, we are in a market that doesn't really grow in in capital expenditure and as the previous slide showed doesn't even grow in in revenues either and our main projection here for the market is that those trends will continue we will not have much revenue growth in because of 5g or go looking ahead in the market here and i will the rest of the material will partly explain why we believe that is the case now the reason why it still works out quite well for operators and why they are still reasonably profitable is seen to the right hand side of this slide where we see how the spectrum allocation is happening in this industry. So two things that we can notice here. On one hand we are shifting from 3G to 4G and now to 5G. That means that we can just because of that reason increase capacity in networks. But the second most, the second important thing here is that we're also adding, allocating more spectrum for operators. So that's also a reason why you can grow in capacity in networks without having too high capex burden. Basically, you 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 uh, install, you upgrade equipment on the existing cell sites you have. You don't build too many new ones. So that's why the equation works for the operators. Now. Looking a little bit at the technology side of um, 5G, I won't be very detailed, but just to give a flavor of what we're really talking about happening in the network side here. So most of the time when we get a new gen generation technology, we look at the middle box here, which is the radio access network part. Um, and actually this time around, the difference between 4G and 5G is quite small. We estimate it to be around 30% improvement. So it's not that big. The reason why we get uh, so much more capacity and higher throughput is into the lower side of that radio access network box. And that's because we are using uh, advanced antenna techniques like massive MIMO and beamforming. And the reason why we can do that is because we, can, we are beginning to use higher spectrum from 3.5 gigahertz and upwards. So that's one reason um, why we get this capacity improvement. If we move on to the left hand side here, we have the core network side. And this time around, it's actually quite a lot of focus in the industry on the core network side. So here we get concepts like uh, distributed data centers and mobile edge computing, which you can see on the top of that box. And that is allowing operators to compute the application very near to the user and therefore thereby get low latency and, and, and very high efficiency. And we are also introducing concepts like uh, software defined networking and network functions virtualization. So on the first one, we can control the network from a single point and configure the network from a single point instead of going to each and every single node in a network. And on the right hand side, we are introducing virtualization where we separate, separate hardware control and applications uh, of the various functions in the network. And a lot of this is coming um, as an inspiration from the big data center operators like Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft and others. So the telecom industry has been very inspired by how these companies build the, the architecture around their data centers. On the right hand side here on spectrum, which is, of course is very important, you can say that we have always in this industry played at the lower bottom part of this uh, diagram where using spectrum between 450 megahertz and maybe 2.6 gigahertz. But now we're moving upwards a bit uh, to 3.5, which would be one of the most important spectrum bands in, in 5G, but also even higher up in the millimeter wave 
bands like 26, 28 and 39 and even above that. So the 3.5 in our opinion is a very very good band, very important band because it allows operators to build and introduce 5G without adding too much too many cell sites. They can basically use the existing grid they are having. Then we have on the millimeter wave 26, 28 and 39. Um, we think it will work quite well in the fixed wireless access. I will come back to that later. We are a little bit more doubtful on how impactful it will be for normal mobile broadband usage because of the propagation limitations you have on those bands. So that's sort of on the technology level um, what we are talking about. On the core network side now, all these terms, SDN, NFV, dedicated data centers, mobile edge computing, is leading to something called network slicing, which I have on this slide. And that's a lot uh, talked about uh, as a term. There are a lot of expectations in the industry uh, in network slicing. What it basically means is that you software-wise can dedicate resources in a network end-to-end -to, -end to a particular user group or an enterprise. So an enterprise should be able to buy a network slice consisting of terabytes of data, certain characteristics on latency or, or on volume or whatever. Uh, and they are, it's only dedicated for them. And you can multiply that many times. You have you know, 10,000 or 100,000 of network slices in the future. So it's a bit like going back to circuit switched technology, you can say, but you do it through software and dynamically. So if we look at the left hand side of this slide in the, in the diagram we have there, you can say the starting point is where, where we have it today with low uh, dynamic um, uh, experiences and then you know, very centered around the core network part of the network. And then what we're trying to do is to evolve to the uh, upper right hand part of that diagram where we have complete dynamic slicing of the network end to end avail available ac the cross across the whole network. Now what is important to note here on the right hand side of this slide is the timeline from which we can expect that. So when we are in 2018 you can say that we have elements of network slicing already uh, in the 4G era with concepts like dedicated core network with VPN and, and so forth. So bits and pieces of it are available today. But then it will take you know, a lot of core network development, a lot of migration from legacy to the latest technology to really be able to benefit from all the capabilities of network uh, slicing. So we expect sort of the first step where you have static slicing. That means that you still, you know, manually configure slices for an um, for an operator, and it takes many many some weeks to do that. That will become sort of reality in the 2021 2022 time perspective, and the more dynamic version of it, where it's sort of easy to configure and can be changed dynamically and sold and, and provisioned and changed for many many users simultaneously. That's more something that happens in the 2023 2024 something like that. We think the main importance of network slicing for an operator is that it can lower the cost of, of, provide to, of, of building and providing those kind of ser services for their customers. As a revenue generator we are more doubtful because this is a migrational strategy where basically all operators will come simultaneously to the market with network slicing and therefore there will also be a price competition element into it. But the main benefit as we see it is that it can save uh, money and cost for operators when they move this way forward with their core network. If we look at the timeline which I have illustrated in, in this diagram uh, for 5G, um, the good news is that 5G is the first mobile standard that arrives ahead of schedule. And for me that has been working with all five generations, it's the first time I'm experiencing that. 4G was relatively well on time, but this time it looks like we will have most things in place already next year, it is 2019. So if we start on the top here, on the standardization level, we are working with two releases, um, uh, release 15 from 3G, 3GPP and release 16. 
The first release is sort of has been delivered already, and that's the non-standalone version of of 5G. Non-standalone version really means that you're you, you're anchoring the service in your 4G network. So 5G will thereby be an extension in capacity and throughput th because of the new spectrum uh, and the base stations you install there. But from a service perspective, it's very much anchored into the 4G network. Standalone is where you have end-to-end -end 5G, core 5G and radio 5G. And that could, for instance, be used for having uh, more simple devices, only 5G capable devices on the user side. And that is actually a little bit later, so that will become standardization fully completed by around 2020. So right now, m much of the focus in this industry is to deliver the non-standalone non version of, of 5G. And that is what is being shipped today. So if we then look at the, uh, the, the lower part there with network equipment and devices, uh, you can say that most of the equipment that is being delivered today from the uh, equipment vendors is actually to a less or greater extent prepared for 5G. You can upgrade it to um, 5G software-wise when, when you like to launch that in 2020 or so. Uh, devices, same thing. I will come back to that uh, a little more in detail in, in the following slides. But Overall, we can expect devices to arrive to the market in during next year already. And that means that if we look at the gray, uh, sort of the brown bars in this diagram, that trial deployments are happening right now. There are many, many launches and trials being announced and where operators are for marketing purposes are showcasing 5G, but also to get their early access to the technology so they can learn about 5G in, in real life, so to speak. The main focus right now is on fixed wireless access deployments in the US and other selected markets. I will come back to that. So you can say that we are in the, already in the initial deployment phase of, of 5G. Then we can expect a ramp up phase coming from mid 2020 to 2022 something, where it's sort of most of the rollout will be really based on 5G. And then we expect mass adoption from mid-2022 and onwards. But all this means that we are really here on track, uh, uh, timeline-wise, with 5G technology. There is no doubt that, that it, it will really arrive uh, to the market next year. If we look at the equipment side of this industry, which is always very interesting and is starting at the top here with the infrastructure vendors. You can say that today we have three global vendors. We have Huawei, Ericsson and Nokia and, and they sort of share you know, a bulk of this market today. Uh, they are challenged by uh, primarily Samsung and ZTE. Uh, our projection is that uh, the three ones that are in the top uh, Huawei, Ericsson and Nokia, they will come out as winners in this race. And the main reason why we think so is that we have come to a stage where we are in the mature industry. Uh, the, it's not growing any longer. So even though Samsung and, and to a certain extent said they are capable of technically building those products, they, their starting point is too low market share to really become global players. So if you take Samsung, who is a very resourceful company, it's no problem for them really through, through their R&D budget to build um, network equipment for 5G. But it's much harder for them to have the global footprint of people that are selling and operating and supporting operators. Because for that you need many ten thousands of people. And that's why the reason why companies like Nokia and Ericsson and also Huawei have you know, around 100,000 people working to run that business. And that will be too hard for these challengers to achieve, in our opinion. If we move on to the device side, um, it's also dominated by three players, Apple, Samsung and Huawei. Um, and we basically expect the same outcome there. Um, they are challenged by for instance, LG uh, of Korea and uh, Sony in Japan, and then from the Chinese side, Xiaomi, Oppo and, and Vivo. 
But for the same reasons, uh, the, the R&D budgets of the three top ones, which is you know, far beyond 10 billion US dollar each, means that they build their products end to end with their own chipset technology most of the time uh, and with many technology choices that are built on their proprietary technology that gives them a, an advantage in the market. For the challenger, they need to source it from the open market and as it looks today, many of the proprietary solutions based by these three top vendors uh, gives them a head, an advantage in the market. So there will be more than three vendors, no doubt, but in the top tier segment, we expect the three ones that are in top today to remain there and the tier one ones, whoever comes out at winners, will more be present in the mid tier and, and low end of the market. If we look at the chipset side, which is very interesting, uh, and one reason why we have this um, strong competition in the market is because Qualcomm, who is a chipset company, who completely dominated the chipset market in, in, um, in the late part of 3G when we had HSP available, available, basically their chipsets were in every advanced smartphone at that time. They lost that share a bit. Uh, and now they're making a big bet to come back as a dominating chip vendors. Um, and they like to sell to the whole market, of course, um, uh, and come back to the position they had. But from a Huawei, Samsung and Apple perspective, um, they don't necessarily like to be too dependent on Qualcomm. So they are betting very much on having their own alternative technology solutions, sometimes built uh, in-house and sometimes sourced by other sources. And that race is sort of fueling the ecosystem with early access to devices in 5G. And that's why we will have a fairly good selection of 5G devices available already next year. So overall, um, the vendor situation with infrastructure devices and ships that looks very promising, uh, but it's a very tough race to be in that category because it's super competitive. Okay, if we look at it from a regional and country perspective, you know, who is sort of leading the race in 5G, uh, not surprisingly maybe, uh, we have two countries, the US and China, who are really leading this race. The US administration has a, have a very clear focus, a very ambitious 5G agenda. They like to be first with 5G and they like that to happen through a collective effort from the regulatory bodies, from the industry and from the government. So it's you know close cooperation between the entities there uh, and the objective is of course that uh, the US should be leading in 5G and then be able to export products and services based on 5G to the global market. China naturally has the same agenda and in the race with US they have ramped up investments in 5G significantly. And of course the same thing with South Korea and Japan. Um, the same ambitions but of course since they are relatively speaking, smaller countries compared to the US and China, uh, maybe they will not be so visible as the first two ones here. And then we have Europe um, falling behind uh, a bit. Uh, in Europe, I would say we don't have a strong industry agenda where we like to you know, support and drive the, our industry to be, uh, be able to export goods and products services based on 5G. We more have a um, a consumer focus where we like to achieve low prices of mobile broadband for the users and maybe that's only that in my opinion that European policymakers and regulators are focusing on uh, and you can say they have been somewhat successful because we have very low mobile uh, broadband prices in Europe but the price we are paying for that on the other side is that we have lower investment levels. So we have, for instance, continuously invested less in infrastructure than the US have for the last 10 years. And that's why we believe that Europe will probably be three, four, five years behind the leading markets in 5G. Moving then on to how deployment actually will happen and what it will look like. So as I stated in the previous slides, uh, we are in the initial deployment era where we are securing spectrum through auctions, where we are reforming legacy spectrum to be used for 5G, where we upgrade 
antenna installations to move to advanced uh, 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 a massive MIMO, uh, upgrade you know baseband units to be capable capable to support 5G. So it's a lot of preparatory work uh, happening right now, and which will allow a ramp up then from 2020 and onwards, when we have the ramp up phase of of 5G when more devices are becoming available. We are maybe beginning to densify to a certain extent um, our, our grid and adding maybe to a certain amount of small cells. Um, and then of course we still use 4G as an anchoring service for, for the network by gradually moving into also 5G core development. And then get into the mass deployment phase from mid 2022 and onwards. Technically you can say this could happen earlier. What is not making it happening earlier is the capex constraints this industry have. And I can illustrate that on the next slide, but it's very important to notice before I move there to say that all what I'm describing now will happen in the operator from an operator perspective with very, very high focus on cost efficiency and managing capex budgets very tightly. So everything in terms of sharing and you know operational transformation, getting a lower cost base, offloading to Wi-Fi, all those things will be very important for operators. Uh, on this slide, what we can see is a scenario uh, which we found from a report in the UK uh, in, or about Great Britain where um, they have uh, analyzed the market and they've made a scenario where they say if the operators in Great Britain are investing two billion pounds per year, which would represent 13% of revenue, so it's a very high, very high budget compared to what it normally is. Uh, and there are four operators and they share two networks and they begin to roll out 5G in 2020. Then it will take seven years before they reach 90% population coverage and about 27% of area coverage. And it will take them 10 years to reach 98% population coverage and 50% area coverage. And this of course shows that it will take, if you, from a European perspective, it takes some time before we have all the benefits and the capabilities of 5G in place. It's not sort of happening immediately in 2020. And again, the reason here is the capex constraints that operators are having. And this is actually a bit different from how it would look in, in the US and in China, South Korea and Japan. They will roll out 5G faster than we will and we will, as I said before, three, four, five years behind them. Now, Coming into the business side of 5G, which is of course tremendously important, we have it divided it here into three areas, fixed wireless access, enhanced mobile broadband, and internet of things, and the massive and critical uh, side of, of IoT. So if I start with the middle one here, enhanced mobile broadband, um, this will of course be uh, you know, improvement for users, it will be no noticeable when we walk down the streets uh, in urban areas in 2020 and onwards and experience 5G. We will have higher data speed, we will have lower latency and there will be capacity to support many simultaneous users. And that allows us to move into usage of 4K video, 8K streaming, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality and so forth. But in our opinion, it will not mean that operators can charge more to, oper to, to their customers because of, this, because of these improvements. And the main reason for that is that we have done the same thing for the last 10 years. In, 10 years ago we were at the early versions of HSPA, we moved to HSPA Plus uh, and we introduced LTE and LTE Advanced and LTE Advanced Pro and we have improved throughput in built out capacity, we have lowered latency, but the, the net result is still that customers don't pay more in aggregate when they, than what they have done in the past. So just because we continue on that path with 5G, we don't believe it will lead to increased revenues. And, and one way to explain that also is to say that 
uh, the offerings from the operators are very similar from a customer perspective. It's, they provide roughly the same coverage. Uh, they, they use the same technical standards. It's very hard to say that one network is better than the other because of this and that vendor and so forth. And we are using the same devices from Samsung, Apple and Huawei and others. So that is similar too. And that's why price is a very important differentiation point in this industry. And that's why also the price competition leads to lower revenues or flat revenue development for the industry. If we move on to the left hand side here, fixed wireless access, um, I have to say that that is something we have become a little bit more optimistic about over the last two years or so. Uh, historically, fixed wireless access hasn't really delivered much uh, revenues or, or for operators or for anyone trying into that, that side of the business. But what happens with with 5G is that there is much more money put behind it. We get first of all the advanced antenna techniques, massive MIMO and beam forming which will take us closer to fiber, uh, um, fiber speeds. Uh, and also there are a number of players betting on this that fueling the ecosystem. So we are optimi more optimistic about fixed wireless access than we just were two years ago and I will come back to that in, a, in following slides. If we then move on to the right side of this uh, slide, we have Internet of Things, uh, where there are expectations that there will be 4.1 billion connected IoT uh, things by 2024. And that is, of course, you know, very fast growth, but we don't expect revenues to grow so quickly there. And I will come back to that in a separate slide as well. So first, talking about fixed wireless access then. So here um, we have the operator who is pioneering that. Uh, on the top here is uh, Verizon in the US. And they have been you know, very bold uh, and outspoken about the fixed wireless access opportunity. Uh, they are so keen to launch, they, have even, uh, um, they are even launch basing the first launch of a proprietary version of 5G, which is sort of unique to them. They have estimated that they can reach through fixed wireless access technology, they can reach 30 million households in the US and they expect that they can pay 50 to 70 US dollars per household and that would lead to a possible revenue increase for them of about 15 to 20 percent uh, above current revenue levels. We think uh, that is a bit too optimistic. Uh, we are a little bit more conservative in assessing that opportunity. Uh, but we believe it exists and maybe in our opinion it could be something of 7 to 10 percent, which is not bad in a market that generally doesn't have any growth. We have similar, uh, but you know, not as strong investment, but still big interest in Europe, where there are trials going on uh, in Switzerland and in Germany and in the Baltics, um, and where they instead, where they are replacing uh, DSL with 5G or experimenting replacing DSL with 5G instead of fiber rollout. So that looks quite promising as well. And also in Asia Pacific we have operators in the Philippines, uh, we have in Australia um, uh, where they are also planning to launch this in 2019. So overall uh, we can expect some growth from fixed wireless access because it delivers, it solves some of the historical problems with with um, earlier trials of fixed wireless access technology, mainly through the uh, increase we get with uh, massive MIMO solutions in 5G. Uh, so that's perhaps something to be a little bit optimistic about. If we move on to IoT, um, I try to take us through that step by step, starting on the left hand side here. Um, in 2018 there were about 1 billion cellular uh, IoT connections and in the latest Ericsson uh, mobility report they say that they expect 4.1 billion cellular connections by 2024. Uh, what is worth noticing here is that there were also uh, 7.6 billion non-cellular solutions uh, or, uh, available in 2018 and it's expected to grow to 18.2 by 2024. So already there we can say that not everything wirelessly connected um, to internet 
things being connected to the internet will be on cellular. Only a part of it will be on cellular. If we look at the next column, which is showing the revenue development for operators that are betting on IoT uh, and how that relates to the overall revenues of those operators, what we see there is quite interesting because it's not sort of any kind of exponential or fast growth there. It's actually fairly, you know, linear growth in a smaller scale, I would even say. Um, so a leading operator like uh, Vodafone, who is generating about 800 million euros annually on IoT, um, they are, it only represents about 1.6% something of their total revenues. And we expect that will continue to grow, but it will more, the total figure if we come to 2022, 23 something, will more be like in the 3 to 5% of total revenues. And the reason why it's not growing faster than that is explained in the two in the following two columns we start on the challenges for operators first of all it's a very it's competition from non-cellular solutions particularly in indoor and, and in confined area solutions uh, and also in the narrowband uh, area there's a lot of competition so cellular works best when it's wide area and bigger amount of data sent and received um, there is also, you know, because all operators are focusing on IoT, there's also competition between them. So that's one reason why we don't see stronger revenue growth on the second column here is because of the competition between operators. Then it's about how to package and sell services um, to the various verticals we have, which is not that easy as it may look at at first sight. Uh, it's also challenging sometimes to build the coverage needed to support um, an IoT case because the revenues are so small so it's not easy to motivate business case wise to build a lot of passive infrastructure for to support the case. So generally we believe that the main beneficiary in, of um, IoT overall is to be found in areas that is presenting on the right hand side the right hand side column where we talk about data monetization, we talk about platforms and middleware, we talk about professional services, system integration, and device cycle management solutions and so forth. And that's more a speciality of global IT companies than it is for the traditional operator community. So all in all here, uh, we talk about, uh, we have two things that can drive revenues for 5G. It's not mobile broadband, it's more like fixed wireless access and to a certain extent um, IoT. So if we come then to the wrapping up this presentation, um, three takeaways. There are several of course but I've just chosen to highlight three of the most important ones here. First of all, um, 5G rollout uh, will be gradual. It will not come in one go. Uh, and we can expect, which is the good news, commercial deployments, uh, you know, end-to-end -end available from network to devices already by next year. Everything points to that. Secondly here, we live in a capex constrained industry, so technically we could roll out faster, but from a financial perspective and to keep the investment community and analyst community happy, we have to pace the investments, you know, committing to 15 to 17 percent of sales to capex every year and that's why we will have a longer rollout time of 5g than it would be technically possible to do earlier and and again there are various differences here europe will be fairly slow while the north america the us canada china south korea japan will have more aggressive plans to roll out uh, 5g and thirdly, very important then, the business side of this. There are three cases we can talk about today, which we can fully understand. Uh, we have fixed wireless access, where we can expect a few percentages of increase in revenue for operators. There are various expectations here, but it's reasonable to say that this will drive some single percentages of revenue growth for operators. We have evolved mobile broadband, where we don't expect any growth. We will think the the existing price competition will gradually erode that revenue stream. And we have IoT, 
which I have described as an opportunity, but with some challenges, but it can still represent a few percentages of increase in revenues. And again, on that one, there are other sides of the industry, particularly the vendor community, they are far more optimistic than we are as a company and talk about many 10 percentages. But we, we believe that's because they assume that operators can move into system integration and platform business and, and so forth. So all in all, there are some revenue hopes for 5G, but they are not so big, but they come from fixed wireless access and IoT. I think that's what I have for you this afternoon. Uh, I'm ready to take questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Yes, so let's see. First of all, uh, thank you. Fantastic presentation, Bank. This was super interesting. Let's see what people have to say. Uh, we have Raymond chiming in here. Without MIMO and beamforming deployed for in-building, can the 5G be used for in-building sort of at all, is what I'm adding. Um, I understand the question then to be, uh, wi wi is it without beam forming an massive MIMO? Yes. Um, well, first of all, it's not so much related to that. I would say, um, first of all, when we come to massive MIMO, um, it's, it's not that feasible on lower bands because then the antennas will be too big. So it's not until we come to the 2.5 gigahertz band and upwards where we really can use massive MIMO and beamforming. Um, but then the constraint, of course, is that on, that on those higher bands, the propagation isn't too far and it penetrates poorly. So we, we cannot generally expect 5G to help indoor coverage so much. And that's also a reason why we can still expect uh, Wi-Fi to play an important role for indoor solutions. Um, I think the vendor community will work hard on this and over time there will be 5G indoor solutions uh, developed, but not in the sort of next couple of years I would expect. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. KMU asks, is there a different timeline for the av availability of devices in NSA or SA? I suppose that's non-standalone and standalone. So device availability, is there a difference between those two different modes? Um, yes, th there is a gap there, of course. And that's be just because of how, where they are in the standardization phase. Um, as I said earlier, the, uh, I would say honestly here, what I have visibility in today is the non-standalone versions where we are um, building, you know, on existing smartphone footprint or or or, or size, uh, we can introduce 5G, and that's non-standalone. Um, SA products, I'm 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 not really aware of anyone that is building or planning to launch that in the in the nearest time frame. But again, the the standard is not ready until I think it was late 2019 or something. So right now, the focus is on non-standalone. Excellent. Um, uh, Juan asks, how do you see the evolution of 5G for emerging markets? Has North Stream made some research on Latin American markets? Um, I mean, we are not a, a research company. We are a consulting firm, so the research we do is, is the one we do sort of in conjunction with our project for our clients. Uh, so we haven't done any independent research for Latin America. Um, what I would say here is that we of course have done projects in many, many emerging markets. And, and generally what we find is that there is no pressing need for, for 5G, I would say for the next maybe two, three years. And, and normally the, the, the driver for that is that the, you need to get down in price on the device side of the market and then it's very hard to expect uh, that you will have 5G because 5G will come in, in the sort of top tier segment of the market over the next, you know, I would say one, two, three years. Um, and then normally also there is a big legacy of GSM and 3G products in the market. So you need, you cannot build networks faster than your current
customer base can migrate into new technology. So, so generally for emerging markets, I, I think that will take an additional years before it's, uh, it's meaningful to launch. Then, of course, you know, on a trial purposes and to demonstrate that you're a leading operator uh, when, you're, when you're working in a developing market or emerging market, uh, you can still do showcase and urban area launches just to show that you understand and are well positioned in the new technology. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a technical question here. From an infrastructure point of view, what role do you think the transport networks will play as higher bands are used and site amounts increase? So will we down, download the, the backhaul, yeah. I suppose, is that, the question. I mean, and that's a really relevant question, and it's good that it came, because I, I, I should or could have said in this presentation that you know, the, there is no point of upgrading the radio access network uh, with 5G and massive mine when all those investments, if you cannot transport that traffic back to the core network and out on the, on the, on the internet. So a very big cost driver uh, here is when operators are shifting from microwave and other solutions to fiber. So in many markets where we are helping our operator clients with 5G strategies, the backhaul upgrading uh, moving to fiber is a is a key sort of investment and cost driver. Uh, the, I think the second part of that question, whether we expect densification of network and build out of many new cell sites, if I understand it correctly, um, we don't expect that to be the case really. It comes back to that we are in a capex constrained industry, so generally operators would like to build as few cell sites as possible and, and instead use the existing grid you have to deploy 5G so you can so that's the most cost efficient way to add capacity in a network. There are you know there has been a lot of discussions in the industry about building um, lamp post base stations and things like that. Uh, there are some interesting developments in the US for instance where there are collaboration between municipalities and operators uh, where municipalities and, and landowners and so forth give access to operators um, uh, on their cells on their lamp posts or 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 other sort of street installations on buildings and so forth uh, to promote further densification of network and I think that's something that will develop but you know the baseline case here is that we will try to build as few new cell sites as possible. Okay and, and slightly related to lots of base station sites I suppose we have at least three people uh, sort of joining in on the same kind of topic which, which is it's a hot potato, I suppose. It's uh, uh, health related. So Rahil asks, how much will, uh, will there be an impact of increased use of myelin beam forming on the human health? And we have, uh, uh, we have uh, people chiming in. Someone said here about uh, non-5G movements and the city just outside of San Francisco voting to ban 5G cellular towers. Do you have anything to share on this topic, Bengt? I'm not really an expert in, in that field. Um, I mean, this is of course something that's been constantly debated in, the, in this industry. And, and what I can say is all the research, you know, the proper research that is not speculative, is not really indicating any health hazards, um, not up to the current generations. And that of course includes then 5G as well and we should always keep in mind that you know the the biggest sort of source of energy or emissions you have is actually what you're holding in your hand it's not the base stations themselves um, and so the counterintuitive thing here is that the more base stations you have the lower exposure exposure to radiation you have because then the mob the device you are carrying can send and receive with lower uh, power uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any you know, proper research or so that points to more health hazards with 5G than we have had in the past. And none of that has really pointed to that we are running a risk. Thank you. Uh, we're uh, running out of time and we have lots of questions here. So I will, 
I will uh, forward a final question to you, and uh, then people can contact us afterwards uh, to get uh, answers in different ways. Iman says, uh, given that fixed wireless access is a key use case and driver for 5G, do you think we will see more initiative from various governments around the world to deploy 5G in their respective countries? Iman says, Ireland and Australia come to mind. I'm not really sure why, but it's his mind. That's or hers. Yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, I think the answer is yes, or it should be yes. Because when we have come to a stage in this industry, when it's mature and when revenues are not growing for the operators, but 5G is so instrumental for digitalizing societies and countries, uh, we should think more about how can we, in a collaborative fashion between governments and operators, ensure that we are densifying the networks without charging too much for spectrum, but encouraging network sharing in various forms. So I think we are heading in that direction, and, and some countries are, are before others there. So uh, it's a very good question. Um, it's not sort of visibly yes right now, but it should be, and I think it will surface. And part of the concern I shared in this presentation is that I'm, I'm a bit worried for the part of the world where I live, in Europe, where we are um, clearly uh, under investing so much less than other leading industrialized regions of the world are doing in 5G, so that we actually already from start are falling you know, a few years behind. And that is, of course, a concerning thing. Can, if I round off to say, I mean, I hear now from Martin that there are uh, many more questions, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you are collecting them. But you know, please reach out to us uh, if you like. Uh, I think we have the web, uh, the my email address and uh, our website address. Um, we are certainly very approachable people. So, if you like to get in touch with us for you know uh, asking us for consulting help, or if you just like to ask questions or find you know white papers that we have published, feel free to reach out to us. We look forward to that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Bengt. And on that note, I think it's time for uh, me to disappear from the screen and for Mache to round this up and, uh, uh, and, and give Bengt a hearty handshake, I suppose. So take so it away, Mache. Well done, Bengt. Thank, Thank you, much. Thank you. Well done. Great presentation. Same as we had in the morning. Uh, in the coming time, um, 2019, we're going to have more of these free webinars, uh, both from our own trainers and also guest speakers like Bengt and other respected people in the telecom industry. Um, to make sure that you don't miss anything, and make sure that you sign up to our newsletters. There are different ways to do that. Uh, first of all, um, we have two questions uh, coming up now, popping up on your screen. Make sure that you click on sign me up there. Um, we'll be able to reach you then. Um, another way to sign up for newsletters and other um, information, go to our website, apstrain.com. This is how it looks like. Um, make sure you follow our social media and other channels. You'll find it up here. We also have our YouTube channel. Um, the reason you should be a subscriber of our YouTube channel is that we're going to have our recorded webinars there, like this one today. You will find it there. Uh, make sure you follow us on our LinkedIn and other social media channels just to make sure you don't miss anything. Um, when it comes to receiving newsletters, go to News, click on News, and fill in this form. Yes, sign me up. You will definitely get all the news we have here. Um, for now, I hope you enjoyed the webinar as much as I did. And uh, I hope to see you in our next webinar. Until then, have a good day. Take care.